Welcome everyone. Hello, it's the last day of the festival. It's so good to see you here. The theme of this year's festival has been, can TV change the world? And the one phenomenon I have experienced over and over again in so many of the events this year is that people have come here with the courage to offer their own perspective, to put themselves in the limelight, to be part of a conversation about how we can do just that. And there is no one more courageous than the young woman who is about to come and speak to you now. You know her as Frankie Lewis from EastEnders, the only returning deaf character in a soap in Britain today. You also know her as the star of Strictly. Ladies and gentlemen, the Alternative McTaggart 2022, Rose Ailing Ellis. Hi. Hi. It is a honor to be here and thank you for having me and for this amazing opportunity. I better start by introducing myself. You probably know me as the first deaf regular on Stoke or as a deaf person to appear on Sweetie and to win it too. And today, I am extremely fortunate to be the first per deaf person to deliver the eternal Matada speech. Wow, how did I get to be here? None of us have ever planned it. I got into acting by accident. I grew up never seeing anyone like me on telly, but I fell in love with it and cut it on as a hobby. When I showed this to career, I knew it was going to be difficult, but I was incredibly lucky to meet the people who were willing to take the shot on me. Never have I ever dreamt that I would be given all the opportunity, or for that any of this would be impossible. OK, let me stop myself. Do you know what I'm doing right now? I am doing what I always feel like I have to do, to make sure I come across as happy, positive, and easy to work with. I am being careful, as I always am, to explain myself politely. Because I have a constant underlying fear that if I dare to express my anger, I would be seen as difficult, too much like a hard work, and that I would be replaced by someone who is not deaf. I am presenting a version of myself that I want you to see the one where I'm grateful for everything that happened and thankful for all the opportunities you've given to me. But the reality is, it's been a constant battle. I have to break through a countless barrier to get to where I am. It's been a lonely, upsetting journey. And while winning Sweetie was an amazing experience, it shouldn't be allowed to conceal the hardship I have to get through to get here. To hold the responsibility of being the first deaf person can be a blessing, but it can also be a curse. I feel the whole weight of my community resting on my shoulder, and trust me, it is heavy. To be very honest with you, right now, I am petrified. And it's not because I'm standing in this stage while you're staring at me. I'm an actress, it's what I love to do. I am terrified of how honest I'm going to be. I'm scared to be the deaf actress standing here telling you, the most powerful people in this industry, the way you have made my job difficult. I do feel responsible to make this speech comfortable and nice for you to hear. But my reality isn't always nice. It's not nice when my actor is compromised. It's not nice to realise that my present is a token. It's not nice when my favourite TV show doesn't have subtitles. It is not nice to be being frustrated and unheard. However, let me clarify one thing. It is not frustrating being deaf. Being deaf is my proudest identity. Having an ability is not a barrier. I am disabled because I live and work in a world that disabled me. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Because if accessibility and inclusive were the norm, then would I consider myself as disabled? I am bilingual, which means I can speak and need BSL. BSL has given me a full language. It's given me the theme of inclusion and access to a rich and colourful world. On the other hand, speaking gives me access to the hearing world. I can speak, but I could never feel included. Every time I get given a new task or a job, the first question that comes to my mind is, should I speak or should I sign? Today, for this speak, I have decided to speak. I am speaking because, in my experience, this is the best way to get hearing people to listen. And I really want the hearing people in the room to really listen to this speech. Hearing people can learn a new language. They can learn to start. I can never learn to hear. Yet, I'm the one that's making 110% effort to come to your world, to adapt to you and to accommodate your discomfort. But where's your effort to enter my world? I learned from a very early age that I live in the hearing world. I have to accept that. We see it time and time again, the minority being made, or rather forced, to adapt to the world designed for the majority. So I ask myself, what if I don't accept it anymore? What if I knew the power of my voice to make you more aware, to get you to see it's time for you to put in the work? I have learned to expect people to do the bare minimum and to put this responsibility back onto me to make a difference for my community. And it's very tiring. I don't know if anyone's going to listen to me or this will be lost to the hopes. What I do know is that disabled people shouldn't be responsible for curing non-disabled people of their ignorance. So standing here right now, I suppose all I can do is to speak on us and share my spirit. So let's get started. First, I would like to talk about one of my early professional jobs. It was a theatre production where I was playing a non-disabled role. The director wanted me to adapt it to a deaf character who could communicate in sign language. From the beginning, there was a lack of awareness for deaf culture and BSL. They didn't spend any extra time during rehearsal to incorporate BSL into the script, and the director never expected me to teach the other actors to sign. As I said at the start of this speech, BSL is rich and expressive, it's just like any language. It plays a crucial role in shaping my world and the way I respond to people, what I think, and feel. It can be sensitive, funny, angry, and it's complicated. It has its own grammar structure, different accent, and even its own slang. You can always tell if someone only just learnt BSL or they've grown up needing it. The first historical mention of BSL was in 1576. Throughout its long and complex history, BSL had been oppressed mock and patronised by hearing people. And enough is enough. It deserves to be treated with the same respect you would treat any language. And it's certainly not something you can expect to pick up in the few rehearsal. So for waffling, did I mention BSL News at Espresso? To ensure visual communication when working with deaf and hearing actors, you will either need to hire actors who already know the language or bring in a BSL consultant to teach everyone the basics, just like you were bringing a voice coach. Being deaf has its own culture, so deaf awareness is vital, and a consultant can be there to make sure both the language and the culture are respected. When working, I need to see, I need to be able to see other active faith. I need visual cue, and most importantly, I need the people I work with to know how to communicate best with me. In this example, the director realised that to create an authentic and layered character, they would need to commit time. And so, rather than putting in the effort, so to change my character to be hearing, to make things easier for them. It's lady. My language was oppressed, and as a result, I lost access to the key part of my identity at work. 
it is not one off. I heard time and time again of deaf actor having similar experience in other production in theatre and TV, with that identity being considered a burden that had to be compromised. All of this could have been easily avoided if the production team had planned it and talked about what is needed to be done when working with a deaf actor beforehand. Just hiring a deaf actor is not just a job well done. I was made to feel like I was a burden, like I was difficult. If they had just listened and worked with me, it would make everybody's life much easier. It was such a missed opportunity to create something beautiful if only they'd been willing to put in the work. I employ people trying to improve diversity and representation in their work, but in my experience, too often when it comes to working with deaf people who knew BSL, people underestimate our life experience and find themselves out of their depth. Often they respond to ignore the problem. I don't get to ignore my debility. It is my reality as a deaf person in the hearing world. Anyone can hire an interpreter and provide deaf awareness training or even buy a special fire alarm for me. Of course, it is important to make sure actors need are met, but that is the bare minimum. It doesn't equal representation. Through representation start before the actor comes in the room with research and authentic scripts. It is vital to remember that actor and representation are two separate things. A clear example of this is the role I play on TV, where I'm almost always working with the scripts that are written by hearing people. It can be frustrating playing a hearing person perception of what the deaf person is like. I am grateful for this job. It gave me a lot of opportunity and enabled me to grow and to develop my skill as an actor. They were the only programme prepared to take on a regular character who were deaf, so credit when credit is due. Being the first deaf person to play a regular character is a super privilege and was long overdue. They really made sure that every day was accessible for me. I always have an interpreter. They create a deaf awareness video for every new person coming into the company as well as trying to set up BSL classes. However, despite all the things it did with me, I would be lying if I say it didn't come with its own challenge. It is such a fast-paced industry. It's the fastest working environment I have ever been in. And as a result, I often perceive scripts that is not quite right. They will write my character, who are in the room with a big group of people, arguing with each other, throwing everything that's been said, and even repeating things back to them. Or they will write my character as lip reading someone from impossible far away, like I have a superpower, which is not realistic at all. I am playing a deaf character that is either written as a hearing person or as a deaf stereotype. Even though I am not paid to do the extra work on top of my job, I try to fit the problem on set. And a lot of time, people are very supportive and make change based on my advice. But the problem is, it doesn't get added to the scripts. So when it comes to editing, the editor follows the original script and the changes I made are left out for final cut. This isn't one off, it happens to me every week. I am constantly fighting to have my deaf identity represent, but end up being made to feel like my voice isn't her. I end up being torn. Torn between representing the deaf community and telling our story, but wanting to have a career with a good working relationship. I have asked countless of time for a deaf consultant to be brought in to work with the writing team to help to invite on the way to incorporate and respect the deaf culture. You can't write about deaf people without a deaf person input. Nothing about us without us. Thank you. <laughs> a consultant should be involved at all stages when working with deaf people. However, due to the speed of the working style and the high turnover of the staff, the importance of consultant is often forgotten. 
Recently, I started to see small changes at work. They asked me to come into a writing room and share my experience as a deaf woman to help to make sure their writing is realistic. By allowing me to make changes to the script, me and my idea I pushed it in the final ed. But it shouldn't have taken me two years of repeating my frustration, needing up my time and energy to be able to get to the point where I feel able to demand that my need are met. It's another job on top of being an actor. And it's not optional. If my deafness is badly represented, it means to end up getting the blame. You must remember, I am the only deaf person in the whole company and the only regular deaf actor in any returning drama on British TV. My one voice amongst so many in the company means I can get grounded out. And truthfully, it can be lonely. This isn't meant as a criticism of the show in question. It is something that happened across the board and needs to be accepted as a problem by the whole industry. The reality is that deaf and disabled talent are working with a system which wouldn't build with them in mind. And it requires serious change from the people at the top if we are going to do something about it. So, when it approached me to tell you the truth, I didn't get excited straight away. I've become very wary of the industry. Every job I've been given, I have always been the only deaf person, and it's always come with a challenge and issue. I knew a big part of why Shrit approached me was because I'm deaf. I'm an actress, so doing the reality show was something I have not previously considered. However, I could see that the opportunity was shoot, and turning it down felt wrong. Saying no is a period that most people take for granted. I knew I would be the first deaf dancer, and saying no to that felt so wrong. This was a big platform. I knew how popular Shrit was, so in the end, I said yes, I would do it for the deaf community. Little did I know how magical and beautiful it would also be for me personally. The first thing Trity did was to set up a meeting on Zoom to get to know me. And I learnt very quickly, as you would likely have today, I don't have a filter. <laughs> One of the first things that asked me if I, if I watched the show, I told them no, simply because I couldn't. It was not accessible for me. The live subtitle was slow, leaving me always a step behind and excluded from a joke. Even on iPlayer, the subtitle had not been corrected. I'll come back to the subtitle later. I told them from the start exactly what I needed and that if I were going to be part of the show, it was vital that my deaf culture and identity were part of it too. I wanted my deafness to be present, but not overly emotional or inspirational. The Shrity team went away and put a plan together based on my idea. Incredibly quickly, the team came back to me to say they have a main for life subtitle as well as a subtitle on iPlayer. And they said they also added audio description for a blind viewer. In addition to this, they set up a deaf awareness training for everybody on and behind the screen and brought in a knowledgeable deaf person to provide consultants rather than burden me with this responsibility. By putting this in place, Shruti had made me feel hurt. It was the most inclusive and supportive job I ever had, and it had profound and lasting impact. They let me share my story in my way. And look what that did. We won the battle for a musty moment of the year. An online search of BSL courses rose by 4,000%. I have so many deaf people... <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I have so many deaf people telling me they've seen a positive shift in the attitude toward them. And parents of deaf children telling me that seeing someone like me on screen has given their child a super boost of confidence. During my time on Twitter, I was supported to be 100% myself, 
to cook the team and that and allowed me to be, for the first time ever, Rose, not just a deaf person. So to everyone on the team to play a part in making my experience so inclusive, I would like to say a big thank you. <laughs> Although it was a beautiful experience, the aftermath hadn't always been. I was thrown to study Prime Master considered as a deaf pioneer, the poster girl for the deaf community. Like I said, it's fantastic for the younger generation to have someone to be able to look up to, which is something I never had. However, it comes with a new pressure that I never experienced before. For instance, I heard about programs developed with a view to explore the deaf culture being cancelled because I decided not to be part of them. This attitude of, if Ro isn't doing it, we don't want to do it, put a massive pressure on me. It is normal for actors to not say yes to everything that they are offered and to choose work and projects that are right for them. For me, staying no meant other deaf people lose opportunity too, and it leaves me feeling guilty and conflict. My appearance on Switty should have encouraged people to seek out other deaf talent. Yet, how many deaf characters have we seen on TV since? It is not enough to only elevate me. There are so many talented deaf people out there and a thousand amazing deaf stories to be told. It is not enough to make me a pioneer on my own without allowing other deaf people to have a platform. And not only in front of camera or the audience, but also behind the screen too. Remember when I said it's not nice to realise that my present is a token? Because if you've been really thinking about the whole deaf community, rather than using me as a token gesture, you will be able to get more done. And maybe I wouldn't need to fight for little things, like watching my own telly. Remember when I mentioned I'll come back to subtitle? Ofcom regulates subtitle in the UK, but the requirements that the broadcast follow are different. The BBC is required to subtitle 100% of their show, but ITV and Channel 4 are only required to subtitle 90%, and other channels are even less at only 80%. Subtitle on demand, whether catch up or streaming, is currently not regulated at all. Why? What's the explanation for this? When questioned, Ofcom responds with that decision on regulation are based are made on the base of the vulnerability and audience size, and occasionally technical difficulty. Research have shown that news of subtitles have grown on a massive scale. Viewer aged 18 to 25 say they knew subtitle or or part of time. Netflix claimed that 80% of their members knew subtitle at least once a month. There is a growing market making new of subtitles, so it makes no business sense to make your programme inaccessible, not just for deaf people, but to the wider market. This year, two deaf comp competitions appear on Channel 4 popular show, Hunted, where people have to go on a run and avoid being found as long as possible. The pair knew mix of BSL and spoke to each other and the camera. But when the programme was put on demand, the deaf community have to wait for the first episode to be subtitled and we're not able to watch it straight away like a hearing audience. This sample just goes to show that deaf people are still being used to join an audience, to tick the box and get people interested. Channel 4 is say it was a technical fault, but it comes a year after another major technical fault left some of their programme unsubtitled for nearly two months. And sure, Mistake happens, but when you're often excluded from a natural conversation on that hot storyline or plot twist, the frustration and isolation is very real. Okay, let me break it down to you. Would you watch a TV series that only have a sound on for 80% of the time? And what about if a really important episode were completely blurry and you complain, but they come back to say, well, if more people watch the series, we might fix the problem. Would you accept that? It would be an outcry. 
Yet again, deaf people are being ignored and expected to be grateful for the bare minimum. So to all the channels still subcutting less than 100%, please fix the problem. And to all the broadcasts, please think about your audience. Deaf people are new to being exclusive and underestimated. Just recently, I received an email asking me to overdub the dialogue for the hearing actor who were playing a deaf role. It read, We are struggling to find a hearing pair actor who can deal with the physical requirements of a character. So we end up hiring an able-bodied actor for a role. We were incredibly respectful and avoided the actor doing imitation when speaking. There are so many things that is wrong about this. For one, hearing impaired is an offensive term. A quick Google will tell you that. And the term able-bodied doesn't apply here. Am I supposed to believe that it's impossible to find a single deaf person among the UK 87,000 BSL newsers that could have played this role? When are we ever going to move on from this? I try myself to investigate how difficult it is to hire a deaf actor. I began by asking ethically how many deaf actors are registered. And as much as they say they would love to have this data, they don't. Put simply, the industry is not regulating this data. Appropriately, around 11 million people in the UK are deaf or hard of hearing. But they only account for 201 of the actors on Spotlight. Of the 201, only 56 of them knew BSL. Before I have an agent, I tried to apply for Spotlight membership and was rejected more than one. I got rejected for one of the three reasons, because I didn't have an agent, I didn't go to drama school, or I didn't have enough experience. But here's the thing, an agent wouldn't take me on because they didn't think I could get enough work. I couldn't get into drama school because it was not accessible. And I didn't have enough experience because there's not enough deaf world written. So how is a young deaf actor supposed to get their foot in the door when the door is firmly shut on them from a the start. Luckily, there are steps being taken and companies that have been set up to help reduction bridge the gap between the hearing and the deaf world. For example, companies like Deaf Talent Collective who can help find deaf actors and provide consultants for production and typical C dance who specialise in disabled strip talent. I personally work very closely with Deaf Talent Collective, who support me at work to make sure I'm given the necessary support. Don't assume that you're doing the right thing. Reach out, involve us by asking what support we want. I promise you we won't bite, even if we look like we will. <laughs> there are so many powerful deaf stories waiting to be shared. Here's the thing, why are we always portrayed as a solitary deaf person in drama or soap? I work and socialise with deaf people. Many deaf people have deaf family and friends. But how often is our community authentic represented on screen? How often do we see the diversity within the deaf community, such as different news of stand numbers, hearing device, or race and culture? We want you to be open to listen to our experience and working with us to tell stories that haven't been told before. And that means portraying the reality of our experience and painting our rich community, language and culture as it is. The frustration that is clear in my speech is something that I've lived with all my life. I'm so new to it. Folk promises have become a norm for me. And I often underestimate and dismiss how much I put up with. It is my hope that by sharing my thought and feeling, I will encourage you to think about how you can improve the experience of deaf people when you hire them. We are no longer prepared to be your inspirational token on screen. If you are only going to take one thing away from this speech, please do not feel put off working with deaf people. That is the last thing we want to happen. It's okay to make mistakes. We all do. 
if we don't make mistakes, how are we ever going to learn? But please don't take the easy way out just to click the box. Let's work together. We want to work together. I was in two minds about whether to talk about what I plan to do next. On reflection, I thought, clean shade and ditch down. If it's not me, then who? If it's not now, then when? My journey so far hasn't always been easy, and the future will certainly have its challenge. But it is a super privilege to be able to tell Steph's story and for them to have the potential to reach to its expanding audience. I have created and am currently developing a new comedy drama series that will be totally bilingual and female focused. Wherever it's next for me, I know one thing for sure, and I'm done with being a token deaf character. I believe that diverse, rich, and fascinating deaf story are ready to go to mainstream, and that we can do this together. Let's create together to normalize deaf and disabled people on screen. I can only dream where seeing other disabled people on screen isn't such a rare sight, or where I don't get excited at the sight of other disabled people working behind the screen. This can only happen if you give up the opportunity. Please have a good, hard look at your production and ask yourself, where are the deaf and disabled talent? If you are working with deaf and disabled people, have you asked them if they feel they are appropriately supported? Are you matching that representation of camera two? in scripting and directing. By bringing in diverse talent, particularly disabled talent, which is so often degraded, you open up a whole new world of story, idea, viewpoint, character and talent. It's no brainer. You have that power, not us. I hope you walk away from this and take action. I hope that you can push yourself to be braver to have the courage to make change. And that I hope that you reach out to us and to me because I'm so ready for you to see what I can do. And I won't stop till you listen. Thank you. Thank you. Musical chess. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Rose. Thank you. I told you that she was brave, and now you can see why. So, Rose, I just want to actually first let me remind everyone in the audience that we will have time for questions. Please, if you have questions, post them on the app, and then they will come through to me here on this handy iPad. So, we'll do our best to take as many of your questions as possible. Mm -hmm. Rose, I want to start by asking you how it felt to give that speech. Scary, really scary, because I'm like opening up a part of myself that I don't really show, um, because like I said, it's the fear. I have that fear, I still got that fear. I'm really scared of what's gonna happen after the speech now. Do you, fear that it might have consequences for your career and your perception in the industry? 100%. Because I think this city and everything I've done so far, I always come across a positive and happy. And that is me. I'm a very positive person. But when you're showing the frustration, mm. you, I don't want it to affect my career. You used the word gratitude more than once, and I really felt that. Do you feel that we've got to the stage where there is some recognition that there should be roles for deaf and disabled people on British TV, but we still expect those people to be grateful when those opportunities arise? Yeah. yeah um, I don't want the conversation to ever end. I don't want someone being high and be like, yeah, we've done our job well. Yes, that is the start of a conversation and it's a slow process, but we've still got a long way to go and we still need to keep working on it. I don't want the work to stop because I think it's okay, because it's not. 
You talked about how the industry and society has now made you into a poster child for the deaf community. So it, it felt ironic that you have taken it upon yourself to put yourself in the limelight in this way. And what really was a brave thing to do, even though you fear it could create a backlash. Is it unfair of us to even ask someone in your position to be that voice who represents the frustrations and challenges of a whole community? Yeah, yeah so it's the torn bit because one side, there's, I can see so much frustration that the deaf community is I've seen so much hurt and pain that the deaf community go through. But then at the same time, I'm really enjoying my career. I love what I'm doing. I love all the opportunities that have been given to me. But I just don't want to neglect the deaf community because they are the reason why I got here in the first place. So I kind of want to bring them in, mm. but it's scary to be having that responsibility. Mm. Can we talk a bit about that community? Because one thing that came across so powerfully was that for you, being deaf is an identity. It's something that is part of who you are. It's a culture and a community that you celebrate. I feel like that's really misunderstood. People don't realize that it is an identity and a culture. Yeah, it's a very strong identity. I'm so proud of it. It made me see the world differently. It made me open my mind up. Um, if I've been offered to be a hearing, I would say no to it. Mm. Because the sign language is beautiful. And I think hearing people really don't realise how much they can miss that. Like the other day, I was in an environment here, so loud, so noisy, and all the hearing people couldn't hear each other. <laughs> but I can communicate in sign language. And I'm thinking, I'm having an easy <laughs> way. All the hearing people are struggling, not me. <laughs> and you spoke so uh, powerfully about how you are still having to assimilate into a hearing world. Hearing people are not coming into your world. They're not learning the language that you speak and speak so passionately about. Can you see a time where it would be normalised that we should all strive to be bilingual in British Sign Language as British people? Yeah, I should. Obviously, not everyone can learn to sign, mm. but being more aware of me having to let me see my face mm. and also every work they do involves disabled and deaf people, involves them. I think that is the effort that I want to see from non disabled people. Mm. I want to see them putting the effort to involve us in the world that is changing so quickly. Yeah, the world's changed so quickly, but disabled people is always like, hello, what about us? Nah. You zoned in on some of the language, for example, deconstructing that absolutely cringeworthy email you received about um, asking you to voice over a part. Do you think part of this story is that people are still, they don't know the right language, they don't know how to ask what adaptions people need in the workplace or uh, how to communicate with a, a sign language interpreter. Is that awkwardness and that uncertainty part of the reason that these opportunities are not being created? Well, I know the people don't mean it. Mm. They just don't understand these things. Um, but it's frustrating that we have we the one that dealing with it. We the one that educating people all the time. Mm. Um, but even the language, I just feel like this email they definitely didn't research on the internet because there's so many information out there. Mm. Like hearing impaired, mm. it's so easy to look up if that's appropriate or not. Mm. Um, and I know people are not doing it to be cruel. Mm. They just don't understand it. Just. All I'm asking is just educate themselves a little bit more. That's mm. all I'm asking. Mm. It reminds me of many of the conversations I have about well-intentioned racism. Do you feel that all of these conversations as, as members of minoritized cultures that we're having, are they supporting each other or in any way? Or is it important that we look at them all as separate and distinct challenges? 
Yeah, sorry. Do you feel that the conversation around other minority rights, the conversation around anti-racism, um, for example, has that opened a space in which we are all becoming more aware of the need to self-educate on, on the different experiences that deaf people, for example, also have? Yeah, I think so. I think, um, obviously, they're all experienced very different. Um, so what disabled people experience is different to what um, the race experience. Um, it's a completely different thing. But then interesting, in the disabled community, they're also experiencing the racism as well. But like pride, going to apply for LGBT or for the black community, they don't have interpreters there. So sometimes it's not even accessible for them too. So sometimes all the groups need to understand for each other too. And it's the same for disabled community. We need to learn about other minority as well. If everyone just open up and learn about each other and try their best, it should be so much better. Backstage, you were telling a really lovely story about the Barbie that was recently released, inspired by you with the hearing aid. Can you tell the audience about, about the Barbie and how you feel about it? That's what I said to you that yeah. yeah. Okay. So um, when I have a Barbie doll and they dress me up as a Barbie, um, and they made me, and I feel like I really look like a Barbie. <laughs> you do. <laughs> <laughs> really look like a Barbie. And I, I suppose when I was growing up, the Barbie did look like me. I was blonde with blue eyes, and um, so I just uh, grew hairy on it. So when I saw a black woman in a wheelchair, a Barbie, but that is amazing. That must be so special for, I should think it's so special. They can make it for everybody. If you haven't seen the Rose Barbie, check it out. It's really cute. <laughs> <laughs> Rose, you work so hard. You've got so many projects, I know. What are you looking forward to in your career right now? Um, I'm looking forward to having a story. I really want the TV to explore Jeff's story, the character, to be much more open with different stories. So that's why I'm really excited to do my comedy drama because I want it to be so story that not yet been told on TV before. So this is a comedy drama that you're creating. Yeah. So um, I'm developing with the art. I mean, development partnerships. Um, I'm excited for that. That is exciting. <laughs> and people may have noticed there is also a camera crew following you around backstage <laughs> as you attend this festival. What's, what's the reason for that? Yeah, it's for a documentary that I'm doing at the moment. Um, because I really wanted to show people this style of me when I'm doing my speech, um, my career. So basically, they would be filming my journey. Um, and I'm excited to see what happens. So it's like we go and go, what happened? And we're going to film what happened. And I'm really looking forward to what's going to happen. And it will be recorded on a documentary. And when and where can we see that? Because I know everyone will want to know. When we can watch it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's at early stages, isn't it? It's very early stage, yeah. very early. Yeah. We've got some questions coming through. Um, Selena asks, what is a part of the deaf community that you love but have never seen represented on screen or TV? And how would you like to see it represented? Well, I never really seen more than one deaf person in a TV or drama. I never seen more than one. I would love to have, you know, maybe a deaf mum or a deaf friend or the deaf community. I'd love to see more than one. Um, and also, I would love to, yes, we can talk about their death experience, but also what about story of their own life experience, but with deaf element on top of it. So, for example, for my comedy series, because I want it to be female focused, we see a lot of drama about female and what they experience, but a deaf female experience is different to how a hearing woman experience. Let's explore that. Is that one of the symptoms of the lack of opportunities for deaf writers and creators of shows that 
people are imagining that deaf characters exist in isolation. We don't get to actually see a whole community of deaf people and how you interact with each other in your world. Yeah, yeah. And I just want the deaf writer to be involved in the writing team um, because there's not many opportunities for deaf people working behind the screen. So I would love to, um, for the TV industry to open that door, or invite them in, um, which can be um, a training ground for both sides. So the deaf can learn a lot from an experienced industry, but then at the same time, the experienced industry can learn how to be open and more diverse. Rather than, as you described, asking a deaf actor to rewrite parts of the script so that it, it does justice to the experience. Yeah. Another question. Do the words disabled and disability remain appropriate in our industry and wider society when, as you so eloquently stated, it is the industry and society itself that is disabled? Yeah, because um, I know from some people in the dis really, the disabled people, it only them can decide what they want to be identified with. If they don't want to be called disability, that's them. If they do want to be called disabled, that's it. But we shouldn't hide the word disabled. We shouldn't shame it. There's nothing wrong with being disabled. Um, trying to brush around. That's why we get hearing impaired, um, hard of hearing. I mean, not hard of hearing. That hearing impaired, hearing loss, all of that. Because you're brushing around deaf. Because I am deaf. That's what I am. Um, it's not polite to try and hide it. Mm. So it can't, that's where the word disabled comes from too. Mm. But ask the person what they want to be identified with. We have seen recently, I've, uh, there's a low bar, but unprecedented uh, movement towards really disrupting the status quo in the industry. We saw um, TV access project TAP, which is really demanding better access for disabled people in TV. How do you feel about the progress that we're making now, or lack, or, or lack thereof. I really like that process. I think um, it does that um, the disabled community are becoming stronger and stand up for what we believe in and say, no, this is what we need to change, this is what we're going to do. Um, it's up to the industry if I want to listen to that. Are you optimistic? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Another question, can you give an example of authentic deaf representation on screen? Something that people can look at as a model of what they should be working towards? Okay, so the deaf community is such an spectrum. Some deaf people speak, some deaf people sign, some do both. Some are proud of their identity, some are not yet finding their identity. Um, that is the deaf community. Don't just pick the easy deaf people. Mm. So you need to look at the whole community. Um, I would love the story of a deaf person who's fully BSL, and then a story about a deaf person trying to find that identity. Mm. Um, we don't just come in one. So that's just through representation. Mm. It is remarkable that you are still the only returning deaf character in a British drama. When is that going to change? Well. Apart from when your series comes out. <laughs> I'm hoping that um, more dis um, death and disabled will be regular on TV. So why not? why not? How do you, this is another question from the audience, how do you work with consultants and what is the process for someone interested in being more inclusive? So, yeah, so a consultant is a person coming in, uh, and advice, so if you have a script and you really want a deaf person in your script, a deaf consultant won't change your writing or change your story. They will literally, they will probably change your writing. Um, they will say, right, for example, um, in the stage tech, for example, or um, me sit and was chatting, someone walked through the door and the door slammed and then she turned and looked. But then a deaf consultant would come in and say, look, um, a deaf person wouldn't hear the door slam, wait till that person come in, tap on that person's shoulder, and then look up. Small things like that can make a big difference. How 
bad have some of the mistakes been that you've seen in scripts when it comes to parts and experiences being written for a deaf character that don't ring true? Um, it does happen sometimes, and sometimes it's what, no, what the most important thing is other actors read the script and we're all on the same page. Mm. But when it's not in the script, mm. I come in, I'm not only explaining to the director, I'm also directing the other actor, just to let you know, I want you to tap me on the shoulder, I let, let you know, I want you to do this because this is how the deaf person would do. Just easier to put it on a page. Mm. There's a lot of interest in consultants and how that can work. Would a consultant on set or in a writer's room be preferred even if they don't have a background in acting or writing? Or would you rather a deaf or hard of hearing actor and writer were paid a consultant wage to do this work? But can I move that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, Does it need to be an actor, or, or can it be a deaf person who isn't an actor who acts as the consultant? Um, hmm. It's a technical question. That's a good question. I think um, a deaf actor will probably not be writing the story we like, but they can come in to say, look, I want to do this. But at the same time, the deaf actor needs to focus on their job, which is come in and act. Yeah. which is what other actors are doing. Yeah. So that's another job for a deaf actor. So if a deaf writer comes in and focus on the writing, yeah. that could help. But then a deaf actor in like a research room or something, it's up to that person if they want to be involved or not. Yeah. So really, it's having a conversation. Don't be yeah. frightened to ask people, yeah. what's the best way to do? What do you think? What do you want? Yeah. As someone who has smashed through barriers, this question asks, what would your advice be to other deaf and disabled people watching you today? Um, I think just don't give up. Um, there'd be some time where you think, oh, it's never been through, no one can believe in me, nothing will happen. So time will slowly shine, and there will get opportunities out there. I think, um, Keep pushing yourself, keep doing it, and keep being creative. And it's, you're basically, it's not going to be easy. Mm. That's it. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to happen overnight. You have to work hard for it. Do you ever feel conflicted about encouraging young deaf actors to enter the industry? I know you really want more deaf actors in the industry, but you're also so clear about how difficult it is for those who do get in. Yeah, that's the thing. Um, it's the industry that needs to open the door yeah. and give opportunity for them. Mm. Um, like, for example, if you go in London and for a young deaf or disabled actor and they want to join a workshop, they want to learn these still, and then there's so many classes, so many classes, but how many of them would actually be accessible for these young people? Yeah. Probably not very many. So what do you say to those young actors? You just give them a reality check. Do you still encourage them in at the moment? I encourage them to not give up. Keep finding. I'm sure there'd be one class out there, someone, someone thought about them <laughs> somewhere. I think this is the last question we've got time for, but it's a good one. Um, what advice do you have for people with invisible disabilities not to not shy away from their disabilities and instead be brave enough to show their needs despite having the fear of being replaced, as you spoke about? Yeah, I mean, really, that's their own journey and that's their own experience. It, it don't feel like you have to force yourself to open up. Open up when you feel it's right for yourself. But then, no, no, Sometimes it's quite nice to open up because, yes, you might meet people that isn't appropriate, but sometimes you will meet people that care and will try, and then you end up feel released to open up and talk about your experience. Yeah, and then you end up meeting nice people. <laughs> Is that what So now that you have outed yourself as somebody so honest, who speaks so powerfully about the truth of the challenges for you, as well as the incredible success and the joy. And you really are a joyful person and a ray of light. Um, 
how do you think it is going to, to shape the way you approach your career from now on? I think, um, I think people will become more accepting and more listening to each other. Obviously, these were conversations that we probably would never have 20 years ago. Mm. So it's good that we're having this conversation now. Mm. But I would love to... I know we've been talking the talk so much long. Mm. Let's do the action. I want to see the action more than talking. That is an incredible <laughs> note on which to end. <laughs> Rose Ailing Ellis, everybody, thank, thank you. you. And a special thank you to our British Sign Language interpreters. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you to you for watching, and I hope you thank found you. this useful. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.